On the night of my engagement to her son, my uncle asked Marie Rodriguez, aren't you happy? You're gonna have a daughter-in-law. I had one, she replied. It didn't work out. <laughs> that is true, she said that. When she died in 2008 at age 103, George's mama still wanted to go home to New Iberia. She wanted her car back to remove her grandson's hats and cut their hair, to lengthen my skirts and overcook my Thanksgiving turkey, to visit long dead friends and family, and most important, to see her son get a real job with a telephone company, she used to say, <laughs> because she worried about his pension. <laughs> When will you realize that nobody's gonna buy those pictures? She would tell him. She was tough, solid, as George used to say, with legs like tree stumps, her description, not mine. And the closest she came to happiness was in worrying about it. At age 92, she called us in Carmel, California as it stormed at our house in Lafayette, Louisiana, concerned about the rising water in the front yard. We heard the phone drop and an oomph amidst the thunder and rain as she slipped on the front porch, her solid body rolling into the flower bed unharmed. Where are the sandbags? She hollered, recovering the phone as she lay trapped beneath an azalea bush. <laughs> like most of her generation, the depression hovered over Marie Rodriguez's decisions, threatening to return at any moment. However, she lived with another experience just as powerful. It was a Sunday morning in 1927, and like all of New Iberia, 22-year-old Marie Courage knew that the water was coming. Weeks before, the Mississippi River overtopped the levees for hundreds of miles above Acadiana. Marie parked her Model T Ford at the edge of the floodplain, just east of New Iberia, where the river ran for thousands of years and where the land descends toward St. Martinville. She heard the water before she saw it. And for the rest of her life, she recounted the story, her hands moving with the memory. The water was rolling. I jumped in the car, she said, and drove to the church, the river rising on the wheels of Daddy's car. It's coming! I screamed in the middle of the sermon, and the people ran from the church, and they left the town. Marie Rodrigue, a devout Catholic, proud to be French as opposed to Cajun, was an odd and some would say charming mixture of funny and mean. She has no filter, George said, in response to her biting comments. If it entered her head, it came out of her mouth. And like most families, maybe all families, it was those closest to her that felt the sting. George, you're full of shit, she said on more than one occasion. And eventually I was too. We learned to lie and tell her that what she wanted to hear, that the new clothes were the dry cleaning, that I scraped the insides of the pumpkins for the pies, that we sold paintings on our vacations, that her savings paid for her living expenses, that our dinner guests left $20 at the door, did you not? <laughs> and that if she would wear a new suit instead of her shroud to our wedding, I would, I swear, Marie, on the day you die, let the sleeves out again so that someone else can wear it. <laughs> George, an only child, tried to please her. And perhaps that is the best that can be said of their relationship. He loved her deeply. And he lied daily to his mother because he wanted her happiness. I know for a fact that she bragged about George to others. Yet she existed on another plane from her son, unable to acknowledge his accomplishments where it mattered most to his face. Fortunately, her wit softened the blow. <laughs> she didn't think she was funny, says George, but she had a dry, cynical humor that cut to the chase real fast. Immune to criticism from a young age, George is confident in his artwork and in life's decisions. In the years that I've known him, he coveted only his mother's approval. Yet in one of life's ironies, the harder he tried, the less likely her praise. The saving grace, both at that time and now, as we reminisce about Marie, is the left field humor in her retorts. For example, after we gave her a rosary and a signed proclamation from the Pope, all she could say was, hmm, did he have anything good to say? 
She wore step-ins, not panties. She passed a good time with her visiting relatives. She went riding in the afternoons. She had the envie for chicken stew. And unable to grasp the concept of reruns, she marveled at how good Ed Sullivan looks for his age. Oh. <laughs> in Insomniac, she roamed the house at night, checking doors and the refrigerator, one time locking me out in my nightgown at 5.30 a.m. as I picked blackberries in the backyard for a pie. Thank goodness for my neighbor who loaned me his rope. <laughs> for no reason at all, she stood barefoot on a railroad tie in our driveway and bellowed out the French national anthem as George and I planted bamboo around our greenhouse. Another time, she and her niece, Bertaloo, yelled like Janes throughout the evening during a Tarzan marathon, feasting on nothing but Doritos and red wine as George and I stared from the next room. In the two years that she lived with us, she expected dinner on the table each day at noon, shortcuts not allowed. And I apologize here publicly to my stepsons for thinking that they finished off the cakes in the night, leaving me panicked nearly seven days a week for a new homemade dessert. It was the incessant roach problem that alerted me to truth when I found the cakes and cokes stored beneath Marie's bed hidden, she explained, from all those kids. On the road, George called her daily to reassure her that he was working. He often recounts the time some friends from California heard her on speakerphone after he explained that someone had bought a painting for $50,000. She got real quiet and then she said, how much? So George repeated. She paused again before she got mad. For one of your pictures? George, you give those people their money back right now. <laughs> she was more worried about those poor people, said George, than she ever was about me. Without question, Marie softened with age. She forgot Andre's long hair and Jacques' girlfriends. She forgot that she hated Christmas, and she forgot me altogether. Unfortunately for George, she remembered that he took her car and that she wanted to go home. In her own way. A mother's way, she loved her son. And she reminisced until the end about his childhood studio in the attic and the way the other mothers cooed at him in the carriage. Well, in her early 90s, Marie and George visited his father's grave in New Iberia where a cousin left fresh flowers for what would have been his 100th birthday. Those hussies, Marie snapped, they're still after him. And she never visited him. For better or worse, Marie lived her later years, her last 40, according to George, in the past. Admittedly, the repeated conversations brought tears to my eyes. George, let's visit Lona, she said, dressed and ready for the ride. Lona's dead, he replied. Oh yes, where's Caspar? Dead. Well then let's call Romaine. But they were all dead. Finally, we lied about that too and we spoke of ghosts as though they lived. We explained that they would visit her next week as we grabbed a chance, a fleeting chance, to make her happy. Does anyone have any questions or comments or anything? All I can say is thank you so much. You and you've had dinner in this room many yeah. times. Yeah. And it feels like George is sitting in the room right now, to tell you the truth. Because I remember one time he was sitting right there and I was opposite. And um, I just remember his stories, they were so wonderful. And then when y'all came another time, I told him that he had he had a little surprise that I had for him. He says, what's that surprise? I said, I named the library the George Rodriguez Library. And he looked at you and you said, oh, but there's copyright problems or something like that. I forget exactly what the terminology was. And he says, I'll make this exception for Kevin. He can call it the Rodriguez Library. And I'm so proud of that. And uh, we've never put signs because I don't want a copyright problem or anything like that. But it, it was really touching every time y'all came. And to hear this is just, just absolutely perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you for paying tribute to him here in this beautiful, beautiful place. We love it. As far as I'm concerned, you can plaster his name anywhere that you like. I think it's fabulous and he would love it. And again, just that you share this incredible work with the people
for coming here. It's quite amazing. Well, I forgot to record until you had already made the introductions of who the, the uh, his aunt and mother were. Yeah. So uh, hopefully Doug has it all, and I can't wait to put it on um, our Facebook page, Thank the website, you. and everything, because I think people are just absolutely love to hear the story. Thank you. Thank you. It's a wonderful, wonderful painting. I'll never look at it the same way. Mm -hmm. Once you know the story, yeah, it's yeah. a whole different meaning. Yeah, and and I mean, almost everything I shared with you can be applied to George's work throughout. I mean, everyone just, has a story. Like that. They all have stories. Yeah. Ones, he would talk to the people. That, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Everything's got history. He got very excited about symbolism, for one thing. I mean, the blue dog, of course, is a hundred percent. It's a symbol yeah. all the way across the board. So. Um, it came to symbolize him in many ways, which is pretty amazing. George used to say that in art, um, the more personal you become, the better you are. 